okay, the abomination desolation, the, the reason why this is so important of an event, because it, 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 uh, it's like an anchor. It, it, it just really, uh, it anchors a framework in which, when you look at the passages in the, in, in the Old Testament, uh, the Olive Discourse, Thessalonians, the Book of Revelation, uh, they're all kind of gravitating or they're linked to this event. That's why we can, we can understand why certain, um, we can understand a chronology because, again, the abomination of desolation is a very definitive event. Uh, for example, uh, again, when, we, we, when Jesus says, you know, the, um, in Matthew 24, regarding the abomination of desolation, he says, those days, those days of great tribulation. So we know, obviously we know the great tribulation occurs after the midpoint, not before. And so that's just uh, kind of one example of the importance of this event of the abomination and desolation. We're all here, of course, we're within this, uh, this conference here, and I'd like to call this, these conferences, especially from a pre-wrath perspective, these are participation conferences and not spectator conferences. There's a lot of spectator conferences, and what I mean by that is, is so I, I'm an exponent of the pre-wrath view, and that says that, uh, or we affirm that the church, the very last generation of the church is going to encounter the Antichrist Great Tribulation. We're going to participate in an event that we're actually talking about tonight. This is not a, you can go to myriads of biblical prophecy conferences, and they're talking about events that they think they're going to be raptured out of here before they encounter it. Those are spectator, you know, those are spectator, spectator type of, of conferences. And they may pique the interest of some, but it really doesn't do much good, I think, for the health of the church, especially the last generation of the church. So we're, we're all participants uh, in this because we're learning about a very important event that our Lord himself commanded us to understand. And if we don't, we're in disobedience to our Lord. Now think about that for a moment. Jesus is commanding us to understand this event. He's not saying, well, have the attitude of there's so many views out there or, you know, we just can't know or just be ready for Jesus' return. Jesus did not teach that. Well, he taught we need to be ready for his return, but a main way we, we become ready for his return is that we understand how we're going to encounter these events and how, how we're going to respond to them. All right, so this, in this hour, I'm going to cover uh, Daniel chapter 8 and 9, which is, which is a good chunk of uh, important prophetic, biblical prophetic uh, text. It, it, I mean, we could spend uh, a few sessions just on Daniel 8 or, or Daniel 9, but I'm going, to, I'm going to draw from Daniel chapter 8 and 9 what I think are the most important aspects of, of this text, at least as it's relevant to uh, the abomination of so. In fact, if, if I could generalize, maybe we could be, begin with a generalization with chapter uh, 8 and 9. Chapter 8, uh, Daniel chapter 8, the ram, uh, goat, and, uh, and, and Antiochus. Uh, I, so chapter 8, I would say it establishes a type of the Antichrist. This is a type of the Antichrist. Antiochus will prefigure, shadow of, basically we're going to learn what the Antichrist is also going to do through the actions of, of Antiochus. This, uh, again, I'll explain a little bit more of who this person is. So chapter 8 will establish a type of the Antichrist, while Daniel chapter 9 establishes the time frame of the Antichrist. So fulfillment in, in, in Antiochus, and Antiochus for, will foreshadow the Antichrist. And so these two important facets of biblical prophecy, I would say, again, they, uh, the type characterizes the action of Antichrist. And then the time frame situates those actions in a chronological order. All right, I'm going to read chapter 8. So Daniel chapter 8 here. 
So I'm going to, again, uh, tomorrow's session is a little bit different. I'm going to be honing in on uh, some key uh, verses or passages. Tonight, I'm going to kind of, I'm just going to read through the chapters and actually stop and comment on them. Uh, and then, of, of course, I'll draw some implications on that. So chapter 8, verse 1 uh, in the third year of King Belshazzar, uh, Belshazzar's reign, a vision appeared to me, Daniel, after the one that had appeared to me previously. In this vision, by the way, I'm, I'm reading from the New English Translation. In this vision, I saw myself in Susa, the citadel, which is located in the province of Elam. In the vision, I saw myself at the Ulai Canal. And uh, this is... Um, just a note here. So th this vision, uh, it's during we're, we're told during uh, Belshazzar's reign. So this would be about 550 BC. Uh, verse three. I looked up and I saw a ram with two horns standing at the canal. Its two horns were both long, but one was longer than the other than the other. Uh, in the first section, uh, first half of chapter 8, Daniel receives this vision, and we'll see in the second half of the chapter, he interprets, he, he, he receives a, an interpretation of, of this vision. So that's how we know uh, who, you know, some of the reference or the identities of some of these reference. So for example, the, the, here, the ram, okay, so you have, you know, two horns, one is longer, it's, it's referring to Medo-Persia, uh, empire and why one is longer than the other is most likely because Persia, uh, the area of Persia or that aspect of the empire lasted longer than the Medes, so that's most likely why it's referring to the it has uh, two horns and one was longer. Verse four: I saw that the ram was budding westward, northward, northward, and southward. Again, that that uh, demonstrates. A Medo Persian uh, empire here. No animal was able, or uh, the, the conquering of the Persians, no animal was able to stand before it. And there was none who could deliver from its power. This is pretty brutal. The Persian Empire, uh, if you've read on it, it's, it's, it was a very brutal, powerful empire. Uh, and it was uh, very well known for that uh, in history. And it, it, did, it did as it pleased and acted arrogantly. While I was contemplating all this, a male goat was coming from the west, Greece, over the surface of all the land without touching the ground. Uh, that's clearly referring to, again, I, I know later on it identifies as, as, as Greece, but we know that Alexander the great conquered this whole territory within three years. Quickly. The Persians, it took, I think it, it took decades for them to conquer their region. Here, the Greeks, it took three years with Alexander the Great. So uh, this reference without touching the ground. This goat had a conspicuous horn between its eyes. It came to the two-horned ram, which uh, conspicuous horn would refer to Alexander the Great. It came to the two-horned ram that I had seen standing beside the canal and rushed against it with raging strength. I saw it approaching the ram. It went into a fit of rage against the ram and struck it. Uh, by the way, a fit of rage against the ram. So Greece is going, ha having a fit of rage against the ram. Uh, I think that would refer to uh, the, 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 uh, Greece, they had, um, the Greeks, they have a, had just a, a deep-seated hatred toward the Persians because of their humiliating defeat of previous battles between the Persians and the Greeks. And the Greeks held this grudge against the Persians. And uh, so I think that's what it's referring to here as far as a fit of rage. And struck it and broke off its two horns. The ram had no ability to resist it. The goat hurled the ram to the ground and trampled it. And no one could deliver the ram from its power. In fact, the, the, the last, if I'm not mistaken, the last battle between the, the Greeks and the, the Persians with, with Alexander the Great was uh, 
It's a battle near the ancient city of Nineveh. Verse 8, the male goat acted even more arrogantly, but no sooner had the large horn, that was, of course, Alexander the Great, became strong, then it was broken. Uh, that has to refer to the short-lived uh, uh, span of Alexander the Great. He died young, so he, he conquered within a few years, and then he died at a young age after that. And... Uh, and so, I th again, I, I think that's what it's referring to when it says that, um, let's see here, but no sooner had the large horn became strong, right? So he, in his prime, in his prime, that's when he died. And there arose four conspicuous horns in its place, extending toward the four winds of the sky. Uh, clearly, this is referring to the four generals that emerged out of... Uh, Alexander the Great, and two of them, for our purposes, uh, was Ptolemy and Seleucus. So Seleucus would be uh, had the region of of Syria, Babylonia, up up in that uh, northern area, and let's see here, and then Ptolemy, of course, Egypt, Arabia, and and Israel, uh, the 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 beautiful land, and so these uh, the Seleucus dynasty and the Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemaic dynasty. Uh, kings are they're always fighting it out uh, for, um, and of course the the Israel was in the middle of that um, constant battle between their territorial uh, pursuits. Uh, verse nine, from one of them came a small horn. Well, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes eventually came out of the Seleucid. He was a Seleucid king. He came the fourth. He came out of the Seleucid Empire in the north. And so that's, I, I believe that this, um, that's this, this one horn. And we're going to learn about this little horn. Uh, the, this little horn, it, it grew and it became very great toward the south. And because he, uh, he was always going out, down to Egypt and fighting uh, the Egyptians. And the east, and toward, uh, that would be Israel, it grew so great, it reached the army of heaven. Now, this is where there's a lot of uh, kings who would fight against Israel. But Antiochus, and again, if you read the history on it, you'll see this, but it actually indicates that here in this text that we're going to read, had he just a hatred toward Yahweh. Again, uh, the Persians, you had the Babylonians, uh, you know, even the Romans, uh, but the Antiochus had this just a deep hatred. I believe that Antiochus was, um, if not uh, you know, satanically uh, possessed by well, Satan himself, uh, as the text hints at in a bit here. But it says here in verse, t uh, let's see here, verse uh, well, ten, it grew so great heaven, and it brought about the fall of some of the army and the and of the stars to the ground where it trampled them. It also acted arrogantly against the prince of the army from whom the daily sacrifice was removed. He hated, he hated Yahweh. He hated the sacrifice. He hated what uh, the Jews were doing. They hated their, their religion. And so he, he, he stopped this daily sacrifice, removed them. The, the sanctuary, he defiled it, desecrated it. This is beginning this, this pattern, this type of the abomination of desolation. Let's see here. Uh, verse 12, the army was given over along with the sacrifice in the course of his sinful rebellion. It hurled truth to the ground and enjoyed success. Then I heard a holy one speaking. Another holy one said to the one, who is speaking, to what period of time does this vision pertain? <clears throat> this vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the destructive act of rebellion and the giving over of both the sanctuary and the army to be trampled. There's a lot of history behind here, but um, I'm trying to outline it here. Said to me, to 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be put right again. 
most likely this is referring to uh, 1,150 days that some would indicate that it's between the Antiochus' uh, desecration of the Jewish temple and its restoration. And uh, I've looked at some of the numbers and the calculations, and it seems pretty much on uh, that this, uh, this three or four year period was this time in which it took time to, for, for the, um, this would of course re pre uh, precipitate the, uh, the Maccabean revolt. So it took some time for to secure the precinct, to, uh, to cleanse it and to rededicate it, which of course is, you know, we know as Hanukkah, the celebration of Hanukkah. But it was during that, those uh, few years in which it took time to, to restore the, or as it says here, the sanctuary will be put right again. Again, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going through this uh, relatively with rapidity here, but uh, I'm trying to draw out some of the significant uh, issues here because once we get into the next uh, session and tomorrow, I'm going to be honing in on some of these key texts in uh, Thessalonians and the book of Revelation. But here for our purposes here, we have to go through this, this swath of two chapters to, again, to, to develop this pattern in its chronology uh, for the abomination desolation. Okay, verse 15. Okay, this is where it gets kind of interesting. <laughs> Uh, and, and you get a little bit more uh, disagreements on interpretations. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring those out and explain what those interpretations are. But I'm going to give you my interpretation of this as well. Uh, in verse 15, now, now we begin where an angel actually interprets. So Daniel received this vision. An angel comes to interpret this is what it means. All right. Verse 18, as he spoke with me, I fell into a trance with my face to the ground, but he touched me and stood me upright. Okay, this is, this is the verse, this next verse is probably the most debated in uh, chapter 8, and, and probably for good reason, and, and again, I'm going to uh, note why that is. Then he said, I am going to inform you about what will happen in the latter time of wrath, for the vision pertains to the appointed time of the end. The horn that was broken and in whose place there are four others stands for the, king, for the four kingdoms that will arise from this nation, though they will have hit, will not have in, in verse 23, this is where a lot of interpreters believe that now we're, we're, we're making a shift from Antiochus to the Antichrist. And I'm from the persuasion that that's not what's going on here. I actually think that the, the text here continues to describe the uh, Antiochus, but there's indications here that it's God's intention that we're, look, we're, we're looking, the significance of this is we, we look at Antiochus, he's establishing a pattern by which the Antichrist will also act in the same way. So this is not mere, like, a, you know, histor historical novelty, because we can gather from this, this pattern, and we're going to see, by the way, this is confirmed in chapter 11, and in Matthew 24, in 2 Thessalonians, and the book of Revelation. In 23, it says, toward the end of their rule, when rebellious acts are complete, a rash and deceitful king will arise which I, I, I take it as Antiochus, foreshadowing the Antichrist figure. Verse 24, his power will be great, but it will not be by his strength alone. And this is where 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, by the way, says that the Antichrist is going to be possessed by Satan himself. Uh, the Greek ind indicates that. And so I think that, anti I think, I think that Satan actually possessed certain leaders throughout history, including Hitler, but I, I think he's also, he also possessed Antiochus. And I think it was maybe Satan's goal to have Antiochus as the Antichrist figure 
himself, but God thwarted that plan. At any rate, uh, uh, Antiochus is functioning as a prefigure. Verse 24, uh, again, his power will be great, but it will not be by his strength alone. He will cause terrible destruction. He will be successful in what he undertakes. He will destroy powerful people and the people of the Holy Ones, Israel. By his treachery, he will succeed through deceit. He will have an arrogant attitude. This, this, this is everywhere in scripture. You have it in chapter 7, this arrogant ad- attitude, the Antichrist arrogant attitude in um, uh, Daniel chapter 11. You have this in Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, especially in the book of Revelation, uh, Revelation uh, 13. This is one of the main characteristics of the Antichrist is arrogance, an arrogance attitude. And he will destroy many who are unaware of his schemes. He will rise up against the prince of princesses, yet he will be broken apart, but not by human agency. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that you were told is correct, but you should seal up the vision for it refers to a time many days from now. I, Daniel, was exhausted and sick for days. Then I got up and again carried out the king's business, but I was astonished at the vision and there was no one to explain it. Okay, let me, I, I want to summarize something here or just note um, something about Antiochus. And this is, uh, so he ceased, he stopped this daily sacrifice. He abolished it. And you can read this in First Maccabees, by the way, about his actions. That's where we, the, our main source for Antiochus. And let me just note some of this. He says, while returning from the, his conquest of Egypt in the year 143, Antiochus marched against Israel and Jerusalem with a strong army. Arrogantly entering the temple, he took the golden altar and the candel, uh, candelabrum with all of his furnishings and the table for the showbread, the libation jars, the bowls, the golden uh, ladles, and the curtain. He stripped off all the uh, cornices and the ornament of gold uh, from the temple and he took the silver the gold and he deposited it in his own uh, treasury with all this loot he returned to his own country having polluted himself with massacres and and uttered words of great arrogance and he did this again um, on the 15th day of Kislev he says the king Maccabees the king had an abomination of desolation built upon the altar and he, he took whatever scrolls of the Torah they found, they tore up and burned. And whoever was found with the scroll of the covenant in his possession or showed his love for the Torah, the king's decree put him to death. And I think that's going to happen in America soon. I really, I do believe it. And, and, and you know, I'm, I, I think in a matter of years, you won't be able to find, a, buy a Bible online, Amazon, or you're not going to be able to find this. In fact, they're going to take another step further. If you even own a Bible, I think there's going to be penalties for that. So again, these are these are uh, prefigurements of what we're going to be seeing in the future. Though their strength, they acted arrogantly, uh, acted against the Israelites. Uh, let's see here. Okay, I'll just finish with this. The wo- the woman or the women who had their sons circumcised. They put to death according to the decree. So let's uh, contextualize that. You know, you perform a baptism in a church, that's going to be illegal, and there's going to be penalties for that. The Lord's Supper, penalties for that. And what did they do? Or what did Antiochus, I mean, he was, a, he was one of the most wicked, next to Nero, one of the most wicked leaders he was hanging the babies from the mother's necks and executing also their husbands and the men who had performed their circumcisions. All right, I, I, I could read a lot more. Uh, it's online if you don't have uh, First Maccabees, but it, it gives you a little flavor of who this person is. And so now I want to shift to uh, chapter 9. 
And chapter 9 is interesting because now we have a, a very, one of the most uh, salient prayers in, in the Bible. Uh, Daniel, Daniel is in Babylonian exile, and he recognizes, he recognize, he's reading Jeremiah, and he recognizes that the Babylonian exile, Jeremiah says is, there's a prophecy, it's going to be for, uh, for, sem- for 70 years of desolation of Jerusalem. You can read that in Jeremiah 25 and, and 29. And he, he, it's, it's at the end of this exile. And, and, and so Daniel knows the exile is almost finished. They're going to be going back to, to, to Israel. And by the way, the, the 70 years there would be from 609 B.C. Um, when Judah loses the independence and uh, to 539 with the king of Babylon being punished. That was the 70-year exile. But Daniel is... He's not satisfied because he understands, okay, the exile is going to be done, finished, right? But he recognizes that Israel is not in repentance, and that's a problem. They're not going back in repentance. And let me just no, uh, note here one other thing about the, uh, why, why there was a 70-year exile. It was a punishment because the land, they didn't give the land the rest, right? The Sabbath years. They didn't give the land the rest. You can read that in 2 Chronicles uh, and Leviticus. Uh, There's some other related passages here in Exodus 23 and Jeremiah and Deuteronomy. But 2 Chronicles 36 says it right there. This took place to fulfill the Lord's message spoken through Jeremiah uh, and lasted until the land experienced a sabbatical year. So 70 times uh, this happened, and so they're being punished for the 70 times that they uh, did not fulfill the, the Sabbath, uh, the land Sabbath laws. So Daniel cries out to God, and he says, he says, God, when is Israel, not when are they going to come back from the Babylonian exile, but he's concerned more about their repentance, their salvation. And so he prays to God, God, when is, God, when is Israel going to be saved? When are they, when are they going to repent? Uh, and when, when is your, your name, your name going to be uh, vindicated and, up, uh, and upheld and your, uh, your righteousness upheld? And within this prayer, God sends the angel Gabriel to answer this prayer. And this answer is, and we're, because of time, I'm not going to read the whole prayer, um, but I, I, I really want you to, uh, you know, maybe in the next day or two, read this prayer in Daniel chapter 9, uh, chapters, uh, or verses 3 to 23, so verses 3 to 23. And Gabriel answers the question, and by the way, in Daniel's prayer, Daniel recognizes, he, he acknowledges God. God, we don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve your mercy. But he's pleading on behalf of, of Israel. And God is a merciful God. And he comes through uh, Gabriel, or the, the, uh, he sends the, the angel Gabriel, and he answers the question. And he says, to answer your question, basically, in so many words, Gabriel says, look, when is Israel going to be saved again? God is taking a 490-year chunk out of history. And at the end of that 490-year chunk of history, that is when Israel will be saved. The nation of Israel, they will no longer have this rebellion. In fact, if you go look at... Um, Verse uh, 24, so it's called the 70 weeks prophecy, and practically all scholars, liberal scholars, conservative scholars would understand that the week here represents the, uh, seven years. It's a unit of seven years. And so you have the, the 70 weeks, 70 times 7, 490 years. And in verse 20, this is what he says. He says, uh, the, the, this is the answer that, that Daniel receives 70 weeks, that is 490 years, have been determined concerning your people and your holy city. But by the way, he was also concerned about the, the city and the sanctuary in his prayer, if you read that. 
So concerning your people and your holy city to put an end to rebellion, okay, to, to bring to sin completion, to atone for iniquity. By the way, finish transgression or rebellion means it's, it's basically rebellion. Bring a, about an end to sin. This, a, this is a cleansing from their sin. And to atone for iniquity. This, this is a purging for or through forgiveness. And then bring in everlasting righteousness or perpetual righteousness. This means justice and peace. And to seal up vision and prophecy that is to secure or pers- uh, preserve that which points to fulfillment. And then the final uh, aspect is to anoint the most holy or the, the most holy place, actually. Uh, and I believe that refers to the millennial temple. It's interesting that Daniel, practically all of these elements are linked to his prayer. So God, the angel Gabriel is answering, it, it's multifaceted, right? It's not one thing. It's all these, it's a cluster of sal- salvific aspects to, that Daniel is concerned about and uh, cries on uh, before God on when this. And so, verse twenty-five a, verse twenty-five a says the first part. He says, "So, so know and understand from the the issuing of the command to restore and rebuild Jerusalem." This is in four forty four hundred forty four. BC by the decree of Artaxerxes. You can read this in Nehemiah 2.5, by the way, Nehemiah 2.5. So this, the, this decree to, it was a, a decree, an issuing, right, to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, uh, 444 BC. Until an anointed one, a prince, arrives. This happened in AD 33, about the time of Christ's crucifixion. And this is, Obviously, I'm not getting into uh, all the calculations here and whatnot, uh, especially using more based on what's called a 360-day prophetic year or 30-day month. Uh, but uh, I've, I've analyzed this, and it's, it's quite amazing. It actually comes down to the, the, the exact month. Some scholars will try to get this exact same day. I don't know if we can, but uh, coming down to the exact same month in which, uh, for, for the time of Christ's crucifixion, they're in AD 33. And then Daniel uh, 25, it says, there will be a period of seven weeks and 62 weeks. So this, you have, you have these two, there's three time periods. These are the first two uh, time periods that make up the 490 year period. It will be built again with the plaza and moat, but in distressful times. So again, these 70 and 62 weeks, that's 483 years. That leaves seven more years to make up 490 years. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. Now, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one will be cut off and have nothing. So after the 62 weeks, that is after the the second period of 434 years, the Messiah will be crucified, as mentioned earlier. And then it says, as for the city, now this this is a verse that's, uh, uh, debate, but I'm going to give you my interpretation of what I, I, I believe what it's uh, the um, identif- identifications of the reference and the you know pronouns and all that. But uh, it says, as for the city and the sanctuary, ob- obviously Jerusalem, right? In the sanctuary, the people of the common prince, we know this to be the Roman, because Titus destroyed it in AD 70. The people, that's the Romans. The, coming, the people of the coming prince, uh, Titus, but the people, the focus here is on the people. It's the Romans. They will destroy them. Um, I'm sorry. Let, let me just uh, correct one thing. I, the ruler, uh, Titus destroyed. Titus was part. He was a, he was a Roman general. He destroyed uh, Jerusalem AD 70. But the reference here, the coming prince, I believe is referring to the Antichrist figure. Why? because of what it it says here in a moment. Uh, But his end will come speedily like a flood until the end of the war that has been decreed, there will be destruction. So again, Roman soldiers destroyed Jerusalem and the temple of 70. 
And then this language here regarding the, the, um, his end will be decreed, there will be destruction. This, this links back to uh, Daniel chapter 7. But it's, it's Daniel chapter 7, 27 that's interesting. He will confirm a covenant. I, I, I can only take this as the, uh, the closest antecedent. He will co- confirm the covenant. That is, uh, the, the Antichrist, again, uh, of the people of, uh, of the prince, the Romans, so he's pointing to a future person here because he's going to make he's going to be the one making this covenant. So in other words, Antichrist can confirm a covenant with many for one week for seven years. And in the middle of that week, so three and a half years later, in the middle of that week, he's going to bring sacrifices and offerings to a halt. He's going to stop these sacrifices at the midpoint. On the wing of abominations will come one who destroys. Again, I I believe it's it's Antichrist figure. Until the decreed end is poured out on the one who destroys. So, in other words, I I understand this is Antichrist is going to establish a seven-year covenant with Israel. In the middle of that seven-year period, Antichrist stops these sacrifices and he's going to commit this abomination of desolation. And this is was prefigured with Antiochus in Daniel in the, in the previous chapter, chapter uh, Daniel chapter eight. Now, again, this is we we've gone through a lot of material here, two chapters only to kind of establish a foundation for our topic of the abomination desolation. We've established a pattern. We look at Antiochus, his activities, and I believe as God, in, I, I believe God intends us to look at that and go, look, this is. He was an evil man, but he's prefiguring an eschatological figure, the Antichrist figure. And then in chapter 9, it shifts to Daniel's prayer. And the answer to Daniel's prayer is going to be the chronology given to us quite precisely uh, in which the, we know that the abomination desolation, it's not going to be happen at the beginning or the end of the seven-year period. It's going to happen in the middle of the seven-year period. And this context, the, uh, the pattern context in chapter 8, the chronology context in chapter 9, is establishing for us now a context in which we can move forward with the book of Revelation, or with, with the book of Daniel, and then move forward to what Paul has to say about the abomination of desolation and this Antichrist figure in Thessalonians. And of course, Jesus is teaching of the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24, Luke 21, and Mark 13. And then of course, uh, at the end, I will be uh, tomorrow, uh, or my, my last session, I'll be discussing what, how, what, is the, what is this abomination of desolation? What does it tell us? Uh, what's this message in the book of Revelation and how do we understand this second half of the 70th week of Daniel that's going to be very important uh, with biblical uh, prophetic events. So um, thank you for bearing with me in this, in these, uh, in chapter eight and nine, but I think, I think just reading through uh, some of this text, in fact, I intended to read uh, Daniel chapter, uh, the beginning of Daniel chapter nine, but I really encourage you to read his prayer in light of what uh, I discussed tonight. So I'm not going to take any questions because we're going to be pressed for time. Uh, however, I'm going to be up here and during the break or during the, you know, tomorrow and anytime I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you have. Thank you.